Okay, let's just talk about this. There's been a lot of talk about the Suns being ready to offer Clint Capella the max contract. So much so that maybe they've already worked it out verbally on some level. Um, you know, everyone thinks that Daryl Morey is such a wizard that he can just re-sign everybody and then add LeBron James to the mix. But that's ignoring basic math, um, which is okay. But uh, Clint Capella, if the Suns offer him a max contract, he's probably theirs. And I don't see anyone else really offering him, offering him a max contract. You've got a guy who even on the best team in the league, um, you know, came out to about the, you know, not a super elite uh, center by any means, but he is only 24 years old. So for a team like the uh, Suns uh, who have money to spend, it's not a bad investment whatsoever. And uh, it brings lots of defensive versatility and can bring a defensive identity to those Suns who basically play no defense whatsoever. Uh, but it does bring to mind there's also been all these rumors about the Suns being willing to trade down from number one, right? And if you think about it, if they're going to sign Clint Capella, why would they really need DeAndre Ayton, who's the only guy with that number one luster? So if the Suns trade down, they could get, you know, some kind of guard or whatever, or if power forward even, and to go with their new center, uh, Clint Capella. But would the Suns really rather trade down for some rookie, or would they rather get Clint Capella and then trade the number one pick for Kyrie Irving and say the Sacramento Kings pick next year, which could vary, you know, it's number one pick protected. But other than that number one pick protection, it would go to the Suns either way. And it's very likely to be a top five pick, you know? So you're trading a number one pick for a arguably top five point guard. And some delusional people would argue a top 10 player and you would also be getting a top five pick back and you would get much better immediately because none of these guys are going to really move the needle that much in the short term. Anyway, we already know that Cleveland even early, I mean, Phoenix even early on was talking about their willingness to trade that number one pick for impact star veteran who would quickly move them out of this tanking phase into the uh, eternal mediocrity phase that they are destined for. So, from a Celtics perspective, DeAndre Ayton, you know, maybe this is just self-serving and I'm not really thinking about the Suns' perspective as much, but DeAndre Ayton would be a, you know, he'd be a dominant post-offensive option for us that would open up so much shooting from the outside. And, uh, you know, he'd be our best rebounder immediately and uh, he would bring us so much more on the offensive end that Aaron Baines does. And he'd also even be cheaper contract-wise than Aaron Baines. And then on defense, he wouldn't be probably nearly as good as Aaron Baines, but he'd be, uh, he's got tons of potential on that side. And when you throw him onto a team with Terry Rozier as the point guard playing defense, Jalen Brown being a great defensive shooting guard, only getting better, Jason Tatum with, you know, a great defender as well and only getting better. And then Al Horford at power forward, who's one of the best d defensive power forwards. This, is, this would be a team that could once again be the number one defense in the NBA with the rookie eight in that center being guided and motivated by his fellow Celtics who are all defensive defensive guys and you know we did see Terry Rozier take his pedal take his foot off the pedal defensively a little bit but um, going forward you know he's gonna have to uh, he's gonna have to play more focused defense and be more of that role-playing point guard that the Celtics need a 3 and D point guard, basically, who doesn't turn the ball over, and he's got all that ability. And with a with a post option, scoring option, like a dominant post scoring option like DeAndre Ayton, this is the guy who really shines in the playoffs. You draft a guy like this for the playoffs, whether or not he's up and down in the regular season, you don't worry about that. Okay, so this would be a no-brainer from the Celtics' perspective, in my opinion. Plus, as far as next year, let's see. Yeah, as far as next year, okay, we did have one reclassif reclassification of a guy, didn't we? And I don't think he's been added to this yet. But there was a big, strong athletic center who just requalified, re re so he's going to be in this 2019 draft. But so far, you know, there's no superstar uh, centers that the Celtics might save their Kings pick to get. We don't need R.J. Barrett by any means. Is he even going to be better than Jalen Brown? 
maybe slightly offensively, but not, you know, just not really overall. Uh, so I'm just not enthralled by any of these guys, and we don't really need a, another small forward, obviously, with Jason Tatum and Gordon Hayward, and uh, even Marcus Morris on the roster right now, and Jalen Brown, obviously, with that uh, small forward ability as well. So Celtic's perspective makes perfect sense to trade that Kings pick to try to get you know the number one pick. Big question would be from the Phoenix Suns, they have a rivalry with the Celtics, Ryan McDonough, former protege of Danny Ainge probably doesn't want to deal with them. We saw the Phoenix Suns engage in tricks last year to make sure that Josh Jackson did not work out for the Celtics. So much so that they even coordinated it so that uh, Danny Ainge would fly cross country to San Antonio and uh, not be greeted with a workout from Josh Jackson, but rather be stiffed and insulted. And that's not working right now. Here we go. Yeah, so... Uh, the Suns helped keep Josh Jackson away from Boston, which ended up working out great for Boston. In retrospect, Phoenix probably should have been hoping that the Celtics draft Josh Jackson, but, you know, that's just the way it is. Uh, but anyway, there is that rivalry there, and there may be that unwillingness to dr- deal with Danny Ainge, just like most of the league, actually, uh, is obviously uh, hesitant to deal with Danny Ainge. Um but why would the Suns trade for for Kyrie Irving, knowing that he's kind of flaky and he's only got one year left of this contract and he might want to go to New York? Well, the reason they might trade for Kyrie Irving is because the Suns, having acquired him this year, would be able to offer him significantly more money than any other team. And they would even be able to give him an additional year, right? So instead of like $33 million a year for four years, it would be something like, you know, $36, $37 million for five years, something like that, you know? It wouldn't be anything super max, but it would be, it would be a significantly higher dollar amount. The other thing is uh, the Phoenix Suns would immediately become Kyrie Irving's team. They've got Devin Booker, but Devin Booker is an off-ball player, and he would be a great secondary, you know, scorer. It would be a very entertaining pretty boy uh, offense to watch, right? And then they would have Clint Capella to just grab those rebounds, and he wouldn't even be asking for the ball much, you know, even though he's on a max contract. And then uh, Josh Jackson would be your poor man's Kawhi Leonard uh, trying to fill in where he can, trying to get shots where he can as well. Um, but, you know, with Clint Capella not being able to stretch the floor, you would have guys like Kyrie Irving and Devin Booker who can create in isolation and shoot from mid-range over guys create their own offense and not need a, a stretch center. So it would get, it would make the Suns immediately better because you would have Kyrie Irving at point guard, Booker at two, Josh Jackson at three, and then you would have probably uh, Dragon Bender at four, uh, who's actually a decent enough defender, I believe, and he can stretch the floor at least. Hopefully he makes some kind of leap this year. And then you would have Clint, Clint Capella at five. So they would immediately be a much better team than they are right now. Even though, you know, their lack of defense would really show up in the playoffs and probably quite a bit in the regular season as well. Because Kyrie Irving and Devin Booker, that's a really bad defensive backcourt. But offensively, it's probably about as good as uh, Damian Lillard and C.J. McCollum. And uh, maybe that team overall would be close to as good as the Portland Trailblazers were last year where they were, what, like a sixth seed in the playoffs or fifth seed or something, and, uh, you know, they could threaten anybody on any given night, even if they came up short sometimes. So it's just one of those teams that would get exposed and crushed in the playoffs. But in the regular season, they could certainly inspire hope. So we will see, you know, would the Suns do that? Would Danny Ainge do that? Would he give up that future pick? Would he give up Kyrie Irving? All I'm, all I'm saying is DeAndre Ayton would solve a whole lot of problems and would even be a bigger addition to the Celtics and, and uh, contribute more towards winning a championship next year, even as a rookie, than Kyrie Irving would because Kyrie Irving is only an ever-so-slight upgrade over Terry Rozier at best. And DeAndre Ayton would be a big-time upgrade over Aaron Baines, as much as I love Aaron Baines. And uh, just feeding the ball into DeAndre Ayton with some good passers and Gordon Hayward and Tatum and Al Horford and Terry Rozier even getting the ball into this guy 
and then he can kick out to all those shooters outside. Um, yeah, could be real, real, real nice. And uh, but I'm not sure the Suns would uh, really want to necessarily help the Celtics out in that way. Although they would be getting what many people would argue was the far better player in uh, Uncle Drew Kyrie Irving. Anyway, guys, let me know what you think. You think the Suns would do it? I sure hope so. I'll see you soon. Peace.